Hi, this is Larry London. Welcome to Border Crossings. Today, we are joined by a singer, songwriter, who's also a music producer and an international name in the business, Lorena McKennett, who has a, a new album out. Plus, she's celebrating another album at the same time on the tour. So we welcome Lorena McKennett to uh, Border Crossings and the Voice of America. Thank you very much. you got a lot going on, and we're going to cover everything that's going on with you. But the first thing, you're from Canada originally. And you you chose Celtic music uh, and harp as as your passion as your career. How what what led you to Celtic music and and the harp? Well, I, I was part of a folk club in Winnipeg uh, in the late seventies, and I, that was the first time that I heard Celtic music, and I was instinctively smitten by it, the sound. Uh, so it had less to do that my family history comes from Scotland and Ireland. Um, and uh, there, a number of the members of that folk club had with them recordings that we swapped back and forth. And I thought, oh, well, this would be great to immerse myself in that. But I was still at a very early stage of my career trying to decide whether I was going to be in theater or music theater or, or what I was going to do. But I kept my finger in the, that traditional pie until about 1985 when I made my first recording elemental uh, in one week. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Are there many world-renowned, accomplished harp players like yourself? Are, is that an instrument well, that is very, very popular? <laughs> well, to be honest, I'm not a very accomplished harpist. I, I, I would say that I, I play enough to accompany myself singing um, uh, that I would not want to put myself next to a formally trained harper. <laughs> But um, the one individual who I did hear that influenced me incredibly was from Brittany. Uh, he's still living, Alain Stavell. And uh, one of his recordings called Celtic Harp, Harp Renaissance was, was, uh, was very influential for me. And that's a big instrument to be busking with. Normally people have a guitar, a guitar case, they open up the case, throw some money in and they do their thing. How did you travel around busking in London and, and elsewhere with a harp? Well, the, the harp that I play is actually a student instrument that many classical harpists learn to play on before they proceed to a classical harp. Uh, it's by Lyon and Healy, a company in Chicago. But at the time that I was looking for a harp, I was the proud owner of a 1978 Honda Civic. And that sort of dictated what size of harp I left around. <laughs> but I, 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 um, I did busk in Toronto on Saturday mornings. Uh, I live in a, a small city, about 80 miles miles away called Stratford and on Friday nights I would pile my harp in the Honda Civic and drive up to uh, 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 drive up to Toronto crash in a friend's couch on Friday night get up very very early Saturday morning to get the best busking spot and I'd stay there till about midday but um oh yeah it's but it, it, it is if I was if I had a classical harp it would be a very different story mm -hmm. and you you also did busking in uh, Dublin I guess you went to Dublin so you've traveled I, around I, the world <laughs> busking yes well I, I was actually working at the Abbey Theatre in 1988 I was uh, composing and performing music live for their Millennium production um, yes I've I, I, bust on Grafton Street from time to time and almost got into a fisticuff with the flower sellers. <laughs> and then, I mean, in Covent Garden in England was what probably my most favorite busking story where um, a policeman was asking me to, to move along because I had encamped there on a street where they didn't allow busking. Uh, and just when he was about to remove me, um, a, a woman comes from my right-hand side and intercepts him and says, there's a man right behind him, right behind me who's exposing himself and couldn't he take him away instead? And he does. <laughs> so I maintain I was saved by the flasher. And so, anyway, the you know, you have performed uh, on many of the different stages around the world, uh, in different countries, continents and whatnot. So is there a difference in the audience or what would that pretty obviously there is a difference? What would the difference be in a European our, uh, audience versus a, an American audience, North American audience, Canada, the U.S.? 
they're even they're even more uh, the smaller sub pockets you know in canada the audience in quebec is uh is less reserved they're more quick to respond they're more emotional passionate type of thing you get outside of quebec and and people are very uh conservative and they're very sitting waiting and so on um i remember performing in japan and everybody was like really dead silent until the very very end and then they just exploded and they wouldn't let you leave the stage i mean in the united states it it, it varies from community to community uh if you get into some of the bigger cities some and you're performing on a friday or saturday night people are ready for a good time they may respond a bit differently than in rural uh america on a tuesday night but it's all good you know we we we, we give them our best arena mccannon is our guest here on uh, border crossings and so we talked a little bit about the fact that you busked in different places, toured and performed in different places. Do you have favorite places you like to go and perform? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't really. I mean, there are some, I've performed in some extraordinary venues. Uh, some of those have been, um, uh, in 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 Europe and particularly in summer festivals, for example, we've we've uh, performed at the Acropolis in in Athens um, and various Roman amphitheaters and so on. Um, I performed at the Alhambra in Spain. In fact, I, I worked with WNET uh, great performances out of New York to to do this whole concert out the out of the Alhambra. Um, but for, for us and for me in particular, my my deep commitment is to give as strong a performance for, for the people who are there wherever I am and and hopefully it, it means something to them. Um, yeah. At what point in your life did you want to do this professionally? When did you decide this is the commitment I'm going to make to this career? There was no moment, really. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, and I maintain that music chose me rather than me it. I, I actually started off in university uh, in what I thought was going to be agriculture, um, but a number of performing opportunities came, came my way and I knew I would always wonder how far or where I would end up in a musical career. But to be honest, I never I never thought it would be like this. Uh, I, and I still maintain I have the internal disposition of a veterinarian. I don't have, um, you know, I don't, the fame part is 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 a is as a byproduct that is not of particular attraction to me. Oh wow! I didn't realize that. I thought most people love the adoration of the crowds. No. That's not what you're after. No, no. I think you know. For me, it's just knowing that the work that I'm doing uh, has meaning to other people. I think each of us, whatever it is that we do, we want to feel that our our efforts have meaning. And so, for me, I just feel very very grateful to have <laughs> landed in this career path that has taken me all over the world and introduced me to so many different kinds of people and and has allowed me to to do something that i feel is has some meaning hmm. well we're happy to have you on lorena mckennett is with us are you going to do a you're going to do some songs a couple songs for us what, what are you going to do first we're going to do lost souls why don't we give a listen to a new piece of music from lorena mckennett this is something that she performed just for us it's called The Lost Souls.
border crossings, it's Lorena McKennett, the roads back home. Now, which home? Because you've lived in a lot of places. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I mean, I grew up in Manitoba and I stayed there until I moved to Ontario to work at the Stratford Shakespearean Theater in 81. And, and that remains my my um, my constant home. But it's interesting, you know, the subject of home, uh, it's it not being just a building that you live in, but re really a fabric of people and and uh, rituals or habits that you have e each day or the people that you meet, e even the person that I still buy a newspaper. And and I feel that and I get together with some friends for coffee first thing in the morning. And for me, that that is the bigger sense of home or all those people and those things that I do. Uh, so southern southern ontario is my home mm. but i do have a very fond part in my heart for a few other places <laughs> and you mentioned that you know you were at a festival in the 70s so having been a part of the music industry as you have for a number of decades uh you've you've been a part of all the changes in the business the technology changes and right. the, the marketing changes the way that they you know now with there's kind of like evolution they're selling singles again but they're downloads you know and it's kind of different yes it's been a quite an interesting um era that i've i've lived in and been a, a, in the music business um i remember when i started out recording in 85 it, there were all these studios there were orchestras in the cbc there were orchestras everywhere um but as technology evolved i mean first of all it was more like synthesizers that were putting some musicians out of work but i think what we're really seeing now is that the music industry after having uh sort of still around after 20 odd years of the internet there's one half of the industry that is pretty much collapsed for the artist or the creative uh, class um and all and really what remains is more of a touring business and i think this is because the technology has been allowed to uh be unleashed without regulation and without some controls um when i think back we would be paid like 25 cents per uh, 25 cents per song and a recording like a vinyl or cd but uh on spotify or uh, i would be played uh, 10 cents per thousand plays or on Google Play 0. 0.00013 cents. So it does, it's not a very viable business model for, but I'm lucky because my career was built at the height of the, uh, right up to 98. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's changed drastically, but it's only one now of many, many industries who have been mm -hmm. hit pretty hard uh, with, uh, as a result of the unregulated internet. Mm -hmm. So are you, I mean, what what inspires you? What, what do you do? Do you have certain music you like to listen to when you're not making your own particular music? Do you have different genres you turn to, or, or who who do you get inspiration yes, I, from? I mean, yeah, I, I study classically, but I don't. I, I I it really didn't interest me to be performing in classical music, but I did acquire a certain uh, skill uh, set that is classical. Uh, I, I, and I, I do suppose when I am working at my office, I often will put on uh, some classical music, which is not too <laughs> uh, demanding. Um, but I love to listen to other kinds of um, world music, particularly um, if I'm going to Portugal, I might, um, if, uh, there's Fado music. And uh, if I'm going to the Middle East, there's so many different kinds of uh, music from these different places that I like home. Um, yeah, I love a, a wide spectrum. I'm not. Yep. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> what is the Visit Revisited tour? What, explain what's going on there. The Visit Revisited. Right. Well, the visit was my fourth recording that we produced in, in 1991. I think it was it was um, made available in the United States in 92. And it was really the first recording that was distributed by a major label. So it sort of uh, catapulted my career from being a local uh, Canadian artist into a, a whole international um, landscape. And the visit, um, so the tour is a, a recapitulation of that uh, recording we we the first set we perform pieces from across the catalog but in the second set we perform the visit from in order all the pieces straight through to the end so um and my musicians 
that are working with me. Brian Hughes worked with me on the visit back in those days. I've been working with Brian since 1988. Um, Hugh Marsh, the violinist, he's been working with me since the visit. Caroline Lavelle, who was the cellist, it was like a lethal weapon. <laughs> She's so fabulous. Well, they're all fabulous. Um, and Dudley Phillips uh, it plays double bass, and then I play harp and keyboards. So that's that's pretty much what the performance involves. So how about the Book of Secrets revisited? Is that the next tour? <laughs> well, it's certainly been thought of. It's it, it was it was certainly my biggest recording, particularly with the Mummers Dance uh, yes. uh, uh, hit, which <laughs> I never expected. Um, yes, we're seeing you know in the springtime we're we're going to Europe to present more of the visit revisited i think next summer we might be doing a version of the mask and mirror and and we if we and the of the music industry live so long we'll 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 be considering the book of secrets <laughs> <laughs> well let's hope it does for yes. yeah i won't have a job if it doesn't but, uh, <laughs> lorena mckinnon is our guest and uh i did want to ask you what is a mummer <laughs> Well, a mummer um, is it, it, there's still it's still done uh, in Ireland and in Newfoundland. Um, people who get dressed up in costumes, it's like a version of Halloween. Uh, but people go out at Christmas time or St. Stephen's Day and they don't say a word as in mum's the word. Um, and they'll often dress themselves up uh, as parodies of uh, politicians or religious officials and so on. Um, they would knock on the doors of people and the, the, the people would welcome them in. There would often be a fiddle player or some musician of some kind, and they would often dance a set, as they would say in Ireland. So there, there's a particular a dance pattern that these costume individuals would come into the household and do this dance. And as they leave, they would be be given food or money or something or other and they just travel around the village or the town doing this um it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing when we we, we shot the mummer's dance video in ireland and i had uh, someone who was my local fixer and he the locals near cora finn in county clare all made these ex wonderful wonderful um uh mummer's costumes with straw and so on and we shot that video very much in in a, in a cottage in County Clare, uh, and it ran pretty much <laughs> as, as a real mummer's event. Do you remember where you were when you heard yourself on the radio for the first time? Oh, I don't. I don't. It's pretty sobering. <laughs> you don't go, hey, in the car next to you, that's me. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. As a very was... reluctant public person, I, I don't mm. know. 1997 was the year that uh, that song was out and earned you a lot of attention and acclaim. You were in the top 10 on Billboard in the U.S. and in the U.K. And uh, you were number one on the Triple A charts as well. Um, yes. Tremendous success story. And then it was re-released, remixed by DNA. Did you ever hear the right. remix version? Yes, yes, yes. Well, that was really interesting because in the fall of 97, uh, somebody from Warner Brothers Records and the, uh, maybe the A&R department said, would I be open to having it remixed? And it was interesting because when we were working on the song, we were, we, we've been recording at Peter Gabriel's studios in, in England in the village of Box since about 1993. And um, uh, and when we were recording it that spring, I thought, mm, you know, I've run out of time and maybe run out of a bit of money and we're going to keep to the schedule of releasing it. But through the through the through, through building the piece as we did, I realized how I kind of would have wanted to address the rhythmic side of it. And so uh, when this person from Warner said, would you be open to it being remixed? I said, well, to a degree, I can't have it stretched to be something that I'm completely not. It still has to be, ha resembles something of what I do. So it, as it turned out, DNA, they're, they're just living up the road from Peter's studio. <laughs> um, and uh, they they did that. And and I thought, oh, that much comes much closer to, you know, the the of the rhythm that should should have been there in the first place so yeah that was pretty crazy, mm -hmm. pretty crazy. and that was a, a time in 97 when they used the term new age music quite a bit right know, right they, you know they don't use it as much anymore i i don't often hear enya and different kinds of new age artists anymore 
No, no. I mean, it was it was a title that that was sometimes applied to my music. I think it was out of default, out of just organizational uh, yes. wherewithal at retail. People just needed to know what bin. Did. What section do I put what this section in? Section does it go <laughs> in? But I, I always felt a bit uncomfortable with it because I felt that new age music was more. Uh, atmospheric and though there there may be some atmospheric dimensions to my music i felt there were a lot there was a lot more focus and a lot more going on lyrically and 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 arrangement wise than it being just you know uh, an atmospheric kind of music mm. we're very lucky to have lorena mckennett with us who is on the road touring uh, she she worked through covid she managed to record music during covid write music during covid um, and survive to tell about it. We're all lucky and blessed at that. And so I wanted to ask, uh, as far as the, the new album, which is The Road Back Home, what, what's going on with that album? Yes, I mean, The Road Back Home um, is sort of, you know, there are two projects actually in this period of time, uh, sit, sort of the end of, well, there, we aren't completely through COVID, but uh, a couple of years ago, I worked on a project called Under Winter's Moon, uh, which is a more esoteric, well, maybe esoteric is too strong, but there are some other less no, lesser known Christmas and winter carols infused with spoken words, some indigenous storytelling, as well as a rendering of a child's Christmas in Wales by a very, very highly uh, awarded actor in Canada called Cedric Smith. And I joined forces with some uh, Celtic musicians from Stratford to uh, do some better known carols in between those chapters. And as a result of that experience, uh, this past year, I thought, well, why don't we go back and look at some of the traditional repertoire that first um, it, it excited me when I became smitten by the Celtic music. And so I got together with those musicians again, and we headed off to two or three um, folk festivals in Southern Ontario. But, and as we're often one to do, we'll, we'll record them. And, and if they seem to stand up, we'll, you know, release them for, for folks. So that's, it's a real, it's a special recording of the traditional material that I, that I really became smitten by. And, and Wild Mountain Time, uh, uh, is certainly a piece that I'm, I'm quite fond of. It probably is one of the very earliest pieces I learned even before I acquired the harp. Uh, mm -hmm. When I had a guitar and I taught myself to play it upside down and backwards <laughs> because of this way. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, the, the whole Winnipeg Folk Festival connection with that piece is pretty strong. And it was interesting because one of the festivals that we recorded this at was at the Summer Folk Festival in Owen Sound, Ontario. And the director happened to be one of those musicians I stood on the stage in Winnipeg all those many years ago, uh, James Keelahan. So I asked him if he'd like to come on the stage and just sing a verse with us. So that's a that's what he did. Wow. Speaking of inviting people to sing with you, is there anybody that you is on your wish list you'd like to collaborate with that you if you, you were given the opportunity to pick three people oh. dead or alive that you'd oh, like wow. to work with? <laughs> oh, well, I'd, that I'd have to think about. I mean, I have to say um, from many years ago, I've been very uh, infatuated with Tom Waits' music. And I love the uh, the the poignancy of his, the roughness of his voice, but his wordsmithing and how uh, so he would be one. Um, there's a wonderful group from Paris called La Pagietta. Uh, Christine Pluhar is the lead person there. They're like a Baroque orchestra, but they they will also do uh, traditional folk music from South America or uh, from the Mediterranean. And they're they're I have a few of their recordings. Um, I don't know, you know, Peter Gabriel. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Get the studio for cheap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lorena Pretty McKenna good. is our guest today. And uh, we're going to ask you to do another song. I mean, maybe Wild Mountain Home might be. Uh... Yes, the Wild Mountain Time uh, be the piece that I, I, I recall back from the Winnipeg and the folk festival days and the, the very, very beginning of my career. All right. Wild Mountain Time. Here is Lorena McKennett on Border Crossings.
border crossings, Lorena McKenna at Wild Mountain Time. Were you getting wild on the harp? Is that was? <laughs> oh, no, again, back to the beginning. I, I wish I could play that with that well that I could get wild with it, but uh, <laughs> no. No, it's uh, <laughs> it's a pretty forgiving instrument, you know, when you start out. Uh, I mean, it's much more forgiving, let's say, than the trumpet or um, a violin where you have to really develop technique. It's mm -hmm. it's you just pluck the strings and it's it's a bit like learning to type a bit. Now, you are uh, a, a colonel in the Canadian Royal Air Force or Royal Canadian Air Force. You don't look like you'd be flying a jet around, but I guess maybe that's something you like to do. Right. Well, this uh, this came through a, a, a roundabout way, personal tragedy, actually. Um, my fiancé died in a boating accident in 98. I'm sorry to hear that. And um, I raised, after that, I raised between three and four million dollars on a recording that we had made that year called Live and in Paris in Toronto. And we we forged a water safety organization, a charity called the Cook Reese Memorial Fund for Water Search and Safety. And um, also in Winnipeg, there is part of the Air Force, uh, there's the 435 Squadron, which is a transport and search and rescue squadron. And when they were looking for their honorary colonel, uh, they approached me having grown up in Manitoba, but also having this whole connection to search and rescue uh, through the, 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 the charity that I have. So I was with them. Um, I flew all over. I flew right up to the far north end of Canada, up to Alert, which is right at the very top of, of the country, uh, down to Key West. Uh, I participated in uh, some other uh, international ex uh, training sessions, one in Canada called Maple Flag, where different uh, air forces come from different parts of the world and they train together. Um, but uh, then uh, about eight years ago, I became the honorary colonel for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And certainly one of my focal points has been to not only understand what these serving members are doing for Canada and the international community every day, but also have an appreciation of how their families uh, are. And in the Air Force, they move around quite frequently, maybe every three or four years. And that puts on special challenges on spousal, employment, uh, schools, doctors, all those kinds of things. So the role is, is really a bridge between the civilian population and the Air Force. Um, the Army and the Navy have their Army colonels as well. Mm -hmm. So it's been my great, great privilege to be associated with the uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force. Mm -hmm. Did you get to ride in a jet? Did they take you up to five Gs? Oh. Or? Well, I, I flew with the, the Snowbirds, which are their, their display term team. Um, I sat in number five, which is right in the very back. <laughs> that was pretty crazy. I remember because they you you, you study all the, the, the patterns before you go up with the team and you go and put on your your equipment and I had to spend about two days just practicing, you know, the ejection and, 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 but uh, we got up into the aircraft and you, uh, number five sits in the very back of the V I expect, because if the person they're transporting is not very comfortable, they can pull back, but they go up and then they say, okay, we're going to shake out. So they go up and they go down and all this stuff comes <laughs> and they pull up together and they go into formation. They do this formation. They come back and I hear in the headset, the, the lead saying, okay, we're going to do that again, but a little tighter. <laughs> they go, no, you, can't, you can't go any. No, closer. no, I'm going to inject. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, um, I, I certainly flew around in a, a, a C-130 Hercules a lot. Wow. Uh, 435 squadron um went into theater to like lithuania kuwait uh i've been to romania a couple of times and certainly seen a lot of you know your country men and women uh in the the travels it's um it's a very very impressive um a very impressive group of people Mm -hmm. And you are, since you're talking about, you know, all these European countries that you visited, are you going to the Ukraine? Is that somewhere at some point you want to go? Now is not the best time to be there, but do you, do you envision, because I know you're trying to help the Ukraine people. Right, right. Yes, I mean, in Stratford, where I, you know, make my base, we've, uh, we've helped bring in and support Ukrainian uh, newcomers, and I personally am hosting a mother and her son. Um uh, but we're we're not going 
right to Ukraine, but we are going pretty close in next spring. We're, we're going to be, I don't know, within 100 miles of the border, I think, in Poland uh, on our European tour. So, um, yeah, it's a very, very uh, tricky time, very tricky time. Mm, yes, indeed. It's the Visit Revisited Tour that Lorena is on and will continue to be on throughout 2024. If people want to find out more information about you, where do they go? How can they connect with you? Yes, the best the best way to connect with us is going to our website, and we have lots of information there. But also, if people want to be briefed on any uh, new recordings or tours uh, to sign up to our LM community. Uh, we bailed out of Facebook about, you know, I don't know, 2017. Um, so we don't we don't engage in a lot of social media. Um, and that's that that's that's largely because I have such strong feelings about the unintended consequences of it. But it does make it more challenging for us to to reach people. So we really encourage people to come and sign up. All right. Well, that sounds great, Lorena McKenna. Thank you for joining us on the show today. My you know, pleasure. I'm, I'm glad we were able to have you back on. You're always a pleasure to talk to, and uh, I love the sounds. I love your music. And uh, and so hopefully uh, around the world, when you see that it's advertised that Lorena McKenna is going to perform, make sure you go and check out the show, the Visit Revisited Tour. Thank you, Lorena McKenna, for joining us again on Border Crossings. We appreciate it. It's been a great pleasure, Larry. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This is Border Crossings, and you're watching VOA TV.